Good day and welcome to Building of the Rock. I am Pastor Chris Turner, the pastor of Rock Tabernacle Church in Milwaukee. And uh, today we are going to finish up, we're going to get back into our teaching from my book called In the Midst of a Miracle. It's In the Midst of a Miracle. I've been teaching from that for the last three weeks and this will be the last week that I'll teach from this book. And this is a good book. It's a free book. I want to send it to you free if you just contact me. I'll give you the information a little later on. You can contact me and I'll send it to you free of charge. No strings attached. You know, I know folks think that, well, he's going to get me on a mailing list and, and write me letters and ask me for money. You'll never hear from me again. I'll send you the book and it'll be a blessing to you. And, uh, and uh, it's free of charge. I'll let you know the information. It's called In the Midst of a Miracle and it's by me. And we've been teaching from that. And, uh, and uh, so we said in the last couple of weeks that from this book that it's possible to be in the midst or in the middle of something. You haven't gotten to the end yet. You haven't seen the fullness of it yet. You haven't seen the full manifestation of what God is doing or, or the, what you're believing God for. But so you're in the midst of a process, in the midst of a miracle. But it's possible to be in the middle of a miracle and everything look the same. I mean, the circumstance or the situation that you've been uh, asking God to help you with it looks the same and and, uh, and things haven't changed and uh, you haven't seen a breakthrough you haven't seen a turnaround in the situation you haven't seen the healing that you've been believing for or you haven't yet seen the, the need that you've been believing for met and so it's possible to be in that situation to be in the midst of a miracle and to have seen nothing it's possible we say from this book and from the Word of God more importantly from the Word of God it's it's, it's possible to be in the middle of a miracle and, and to get bad news right in the middle of your miracle. It's possible to get uh, bad news or to have things go from bad to worse while you're in the middle of a miracle, while God is working your situation out. And the examples we gave from the Bible were, first of all, from the book of, um, the book of Mark, uh, where uh, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus on behalf of his daughter and he said, he's asking Jesus to come minister to his daughter. He said, my daughter is at home. She's, she's near death. She's sick and almost uh, close to death. He said, would you please come lay your hands on her and she'll, she'll be healed. She'll, she'll be whole. And Jesus was on his way. But as Jesus was delayed with the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus got bad news from the house. He said, your daughter is now dead troubled not the master any further. Jairus was in the middle of a miracle. He he's released his faith. Uh, Jesus was on his way, but because of the delay, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he didn't get there in time. And his situation, or the daughter's situation, went from bad to worse. She actually died. Jesus turned to Jairus and he said, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. You know the story, the rest of the account says that Jesus went to the house and raise the girl from the dead. But the point that we were making is that, is that Jairus could have quit in the middle of his miracle. When he got the bad news and he got the worst news, that this situation had gotten worse and, it, and she had died, he could have thrown it all away right then and said, okay, Lord, just forget about it. Don't come to my house. Uh, uh, just keep on doing what you're doing. I'm, I'm gonna go home and bury my daughter. He didn't do that. He continued to believe even after he got bad news. He continued to believe even though his situation went from bad to worse and God uh, fulfilled what he, what Jesus had promised there and that he, she would be made whole and she was. She was raised from the dead, amen? So what do you do when you get bad news in the middle of, you believe, of, of your believing process or in the middle of your miracle? You continue to believe, amen? That doesn't change the word of God. You continue to believe what God's word said and what you've been standing on and believing on. We discussed that in the last couple of weeks. We talked last week about the children of Israel. This is another example about how that in the middle of a miracle, uh, you can your, your situation can deteriorate and get worse before it gets better. And the example was from Exodus, uh, the book of Exodus, when uh, Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. Uh, their situation in Egypt was was pretty bad. They were slaves. They had been slaves in bondage for uh, over four, about 400 years or so. And it was time, God's timing for them to be let go. And so he sent Moses, the deliverer, and talked to the elders and, the, and, and uh, elders of Israel in Egypt. 
and let them know that this is our time. God's releasing us and he's going to release us from this Egyptian bondage. And what happened after that announcement and after that process had begun? Well, their situation got worse. Their bondage got heavier. Uh, the pressure got greater. Their, their burden got heavier and worse. Uh, it got worse for them before it got better. But they were in the middle of a miracle. Now, God smote Egypt. He smote, he pressured Egypt through 10 plagues. He administered plague after plague after plague in Egypt upon the Egyptians, forcing Pharaoh to let them go. Those plagues did not affect the Israelites. It did not affect God's people, but those plagues affected the Egyptians and the Egyptians only. However, there was greater pressure on the Egyptians from their taskmasters by way of a uh, 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 heavier burdens put on them and, and more labor given to them. And so their situation got worse in the middle of their miracle. Their situation got even worse when after the last plague, when Pharaoh finally said, go, go, just get out and go. You all can go. And they exited the whole company with their cattle and their goods and their, their young and old. They all left Egypt, the children of Israel did. And they went out into the wilderness uh, a short ways to the desert, and they came to the border of the Red Sea. And Pharaoh had a change of heart again, and he said, I'm going to, he decided to chase after them and to annihilate them, to wipe them all out. And so now they've come up against the border of the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army breathing down their neck. There's nowhere to go. What's happening? What's happening? Things are even getting worse. Oh, it was bad in Egypt. Our burden became heavier. And now we're facing complete annihilation. What's happening? A miracle is happening is what's happening. God is delivering you. You're in the middle of a miracle of deliverance. And it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. It looks bad. It looks worse. But guess what was about to happen? God was about to bust the Red Sea wide open. They walked across on dry land and the Egyptians that pursued them into the midst of the Red Sea were drowned that day and their captors and uh, their, their taskmasters were all killed that day. Amen? So it looked bad, but God was in control. Their miracle was in the works. And just like you, you might be up against some things. And you might be thinking, well, I, 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 wasn't this work, I wasn't this bad off when I first began to believe God for my financial miracle or for my physical miracle. Or my kids weren't acting this bad when I first began to believe God for them to come into the kingdom. Whatever you're believing God for may not have, have, have uh, ever looked this bad, but you can be up against uh, an impossible situation and God in a moment can break that situation wide open. And the Egyptians, we said that we quoted that scripture, that the Egyptian that you see today, you will see them again no more forever. Amen. The pressure that you're under right now and has gotten worse can be just about ready to break open and, and you go free and, 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 and bring it to an end. Amen. So you don't give up. You don't cast your faith away. You don't give up because you are in the midst of a miracle. So we've been teaching about that. And, and today, once again, it'll be the last day. And I just want to talk about just some of the chapters you'll find in this book, The Midst of Miracles. We talk about the possibility of things going from bad to worse in the process and what to do. We're talking about what to do. And uh, the first chapter talks about remaining focused on what God promised in his word. Amen. We, we keep our focus. We don't uh, give up and give in to fear. And we, uh, chapter 2 talks about resisting fear. We resist fear. Amen. Chapter 5 talks about encouraging yourself in the Lord. It's chapter 5 in this. You know, it's important to encourage yourself. That's what you do when you're in the middle of a miracle and, and things are hard and you, you're tempted to give up because it looks so bad. It looks like it's more impossible now than ever. You're tempted to give up. At some point, you're going to have to learn the art of encouraging yourself in the Lord. That's chapter five. Well, I go to church that my pastor could encourage me. Thank God for your pastor. He should encourage you. She or he should encourage you. Thank God for loved ones encouraging you in the word of God. But at some point and sometime, you're going to have to know how to encourage yourself 
in the Lord. That's what David did. When David was in a situation that was bad and he had lost everything in his situation, well, he had lost his wives and his kids and all this stuff and his, uh, his enemies had come in and taken all this stuff out of his city. And David's situation got worse because the men that were with him spoke of stoning him. So David's situation went from bad to worse. Where was David? David was in the middle of a miracle. Well, when the men spoke of stoning him, David could have given up. That would have been a good point right then just to give up and say, okay, oh well, I might as well go ahead and die. Everything I have is gone, whatever, and God didn't come through for me. No, David didn't take that way out. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And the way he did it is he talked to himself. He began to talk to himself about the things of God, talk to himself about and reminding himself about things that God had done for him in the past, about how God had brought him forth and brought him through uh, uh, tough situations before and given him victories before. He began to encourage himself in the Lord. And, and guess what? It wasn't too long after that that he was up, the men were up, and they chased their enemies and they got their stuff back. They were in the middle of a miracle. David was in the middle of a miracle, and he encouraged himself in the Lord, and that's what you need to do. That's in chapter, chapter 5. Chapter 6 talks about the words that you speak out of your mouth. Oh, when you're in the middle of a miracle, and things are tough, and you're tempted to give up, and it seems like God's not answering, that God's not working in my situation, God's not going to break through for me and, and do this for me. It's tempted to open your mouth and say those kind of, say negative things and say bad things. And you don't want to do that, child of God. Don't open your mouth and say things like, oh, this is not working. Oh, things are getting worse. Oh, it's about, we're about to go under. Don't open your mouth and say that. Amen? Because words are important. The words that come out of your mouth are important. And especially... When you're believing God, when you're in the middle of a miracle and you're believing God and God is working, he's working, he does most of his work behind the scenes where you don't see it, and you can't feel it, you don't discern it, but he's working behind the scenes and you're in frustration and you're opening your mouth and saying, oh, it's not working. Oh, God's not doing it. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to give, I'm just going to give up and this is not, this is not happening for me. Well, that, that can, that can stop the miracle power from God, of God from working in your life. Amen. Don't use your words that way. And be careful about the words that you speak. And the, the example I gave was the Apostle Paul. When he was on that ship to Rome there uh, in the book of Acts, Paul was on that ship to Rome, and they were in a, in a storm. They were in a storm that was about to take that ship under. And Paul had been believing, standing, uh, trusting God. A, a word had been given him that, that he had to go to Rome, and he would appear before Caesar. But it didn't seem like that promise was going to come to pass because we're about to go under in this, in this hurricane. What it looks like, this storm has come upon this ship. And things were looking bad. And, and an angel spoke to Paul and said that, uh, fear not, Paul, because, you know, uh, you know, God's going to bring you through this. And you're going to come through this situation. And this storm is not going to destroy or the lives of the men on board will be spared and saved. Well, Paul got up. And Paul spoke to the, to, the, to the men on the ship, and he said, he, he told them what God told him. He told them what the angel told him, and he said, I believe God that it shall be for me even as it was told me. Those are the words he spoke. He didn't say, well, it's looking bad. It's looking worse. Girl. It's working worse than ever now, guys. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see what. No, he spoke and said, I believe God. Now, when Paul spoke that, guess what was happening all around him? The wind was blowing. The rain was falling. The sky was black and dark. That's when in the midst, that's when he stood up and spoke those words of faith. What he spoke in the middle of the storm is what got them through, is what, what his faith was. You need to speak your faith. Speak positive uh, words of faith in line with the word of God in the middle of the storm. When the sky's black and the winds are raging and the storm is, is uh, blowing, winds are blowing upon you. Paul stood up and said, but I believe God. Amen? And that's what you need to do. Don't wait until you see a breakthrough or a turnaround or wait till things get better or wait till you see all of the answers to your prayer. And then you say, oh, yes, I believe God. No, that's not faith, number one. And most likely, you won't see that. Number two, if you're speaking words of doubt and fear in the midst of your storm, 
most likely you won't see that that glorious end. But amen. But stand up in the middle of your storm. Be bold. Be confident. Even though it looks terrible, it looks bad, it looks like we're going under, stand up and say, I believe what God said to me. I still believe God. Amen. And, and as, as we discussed that in chapter um, in chapter six of this of my book here, the, the, in the midst of a miracle. Chapter seven, we talk about uh, focus. Don't let your focus be broken. Amen. In the middle of your miracle, you're believing God to do something for you, but you haven't seen it yet. Don't let your focus be broken. You know, the great uh, Dr. Mike Murdoch uh, has a saying. He said that, he says that broken focus, failure comes from, all failure comes from broken focus, he says. And that's true. All failure and faith failure. We're talking about your faith failing. Your faith will fail if your focus is broken. You need to focus on what God promised and focus on that only, not on what is going on around you, not on what the, the, the news is saying, what the latest report is saying, what the people say, what your body says, what anyone. You need to focus on what God's word says and don't let your focus be broken. The example that we give about broken focus is Peter. Remember that, that, that account when Peter, when the, uh, Jesus' disciples were in the boat going to the other side of the lake there and they were uh, in a storm and, 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 and they were in there and Jesus wasn't with them. And, and, and Jesus came walking on the water, the Bible says. Jesus came walking on water. Peter saw him and said, Lord, if, if that's you, uh, bid me to come. Bid me come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, come. And so Peter actually got out of the boat and began to walk on the water to go to Jesus. He got out of the boat and began to walk on the water to go to Jesus. But the Bible says that, he's, is that a miracle? Yes, yes. No one walked on water. No one, we have record of in the Bible. Two people we have record of in the Bible walking on water. It's Jesus and Peter. Never been done before. But so Peter's walking in the miraculous. He's walking in the miracle. But then the Bible says, when he saw the winds and waves boisterous, the winds and waves begin to kick up more. He's getting splashed in the eyes with the cell and, and the wind's blown around. He's, then his focus got off of Jesus. His focus got off of what Jesus had said. Jesus had said, come. And Jesus is standing there a distance away, and he has said, come on, Peter. And, and so he's, But his focus got off of Jesus, off of what he said, and onto the winds and waves. What began to happen? Peter began to sink. He began to, to go under because his focus had been broken. Amen? Amen. Thank God that he had enough sense to cry out. Jesus reached out to him. No, that's interesting. Jesus reached out to him. That means Peter must have been close enough for Jesus. It didn't say that Jesus ran over and, and dove in and caught Peter. It said that Jesus just reached out. So apparently Peter had walked from the boat, walked a distance on, in the miracle, and was about an arm's length away from Jesus when he's, his focus was broken. And when his focus broke, he began to sink. He was this far away from the master. He was this far away from the completion of his miracle. He was this far away from Jesus, his destination, when his focus was broken and his faith began to fail and he began to sink. Listen to me. The Lord has put this in my heart to tell you, you don't know how close you are to your miracle. You could be just this far away from your breakthrough. Just this far away from your turnaround, this far away from your destination. You could be this far away from everything turning around and from you seeing the manifestation of what God has promised you. you. You are in the midst of that miracle, but don't let your focus be broken. Now, keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on what he's promised you, what he said to you, and don't let the winds and waves of the circumstances and the situation keep break your focus and get your eyes on that. You don't you could be this close to seeing your breakthrough. Amen. Don't give up. Don't let your focus be broken. We talk about the, the dangers of broken focus. That was in chapter uh, chapter seven. 
Chapter 8 is the last chapter in that book there. So let's talk about chapter 8. Chapter 8 is, is simply titled, just rejoice. Rejoice. In the midst of your miracle, when, when, when you've not seen the change, you're, you're, you've prayed and you've believed God, but you haven't seen the manifestation of what you believed, or when things have gone from bad to worse, which is possible in the middle of a miracle, what do you do? One of the things you need to do is you need to give thanks and praise God and rejoice right there where you are. Do not wait until you say, don't think to yourself, well, as soon as this situation turns around, I'm going to thank God and praise God. As soon as I see my breakthrough, as soon as I get my healing, as soon as my kids start acting right, as soon as I see this financial need met, I am going to shout and jump and dance and praise and rejoice God, rejoice in God. No, 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 no. In the midst of your miracle, even before you've seen that, before you've seen anything happen, faith praises God and thanks God before it sees his breakthrough. That's what faith does. Anybody can thank God after they see a miracle. It just takes manners or the old folks used to call home training. If you got home training, if someone gives you something or someone does something for you, what do you do? You say, thank you. Well, but faith says, well, I just believe that, I got, that I've prayed and I've asked, and so I believe that I receive what I've asked for God. from God. I believe I receive it. Even though I haven't seen it, I'm just going to thank him before because I believe his word is good and his promise is good and he won't lie to me. That's what faith does. So praise is the language of faith. Praise and thanksgiving is the language that faith speaks. Faith doesn't complain. Faith doesn't moan, groan, cry, mourn. Faith, people of faith, in the midst of their miracle, before they see their breakthrough, people of faith thank God and praise God. Faith, or we said that praise, also in that book, we said that Praise is a demonstration of your expectation. Praise is how praise and thanksgiving is how you demonstrate what you expect. It's a demonstration of your expectation. My expectation is that God is going to bring me through this situation. My expectation is that I will see the completeness of what God has promised me. That's my expectation. So to demonstrate that, I'm just going to thank him right now. Thank him right now where I am right now with the way I'm feeling. Before I begin to feel anything in my physical body, I'm going to thank him that I'm healed. Before I begin to see anything in my finances turn around, I'm going to thank him that he meets my needs. I'm going to begin to thank him. And, and not just in my heart, I'm going to actually say that out of my mouth. Amen? I, I got from Psalm chapter 9. And Psalm chapter 9 is one of my favorite psalms. And this is what David said. This, this is a psalm of David. He says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will, this is verse 1. Psalm 9, verse 1 says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Verse 3 says this, When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Wait, wait, wait. When my enemies uh, uh, fall back, when my enemies are turned back, that means that David was doing verse 1 and 2. He said he was praising in God and being glad even while his enemies were still in his face and he hadn't even gotten, seen the victory over his enemies. He said, I'll, I'll praise you and thank you with my whole heart and show forth your marvelous works. I'll rejoice and thank you while I'm staring eyeball to eyeball with enemies that, that I have not yet overcome, they will be turned back. They will be turned back. Amen? Note the, note the order. His praise came first. Then his enemies were turned back, and God maintained his cause. Amen? You want God to maintain your cause? Yeah, just thank him right now. I mean, without feeling it, just thank him. Begin to thank him that, that, Lord, I believe that I receive. I believe that you are working in my situation. I believe that you are mighty to turn it around, stare your enemy eyeball to eyeball and say, bless God, my God gives me the victory. And God said, I'll maintain your cause 
and I'll turn your enemies back. Amen. That's what praise does. Amen. And also in Luke chapter 17, uh, in verse in chapter 8, we talk about in Luke chapter 17, the story of the 10 lepers. This is in Jesus' ministry. When Jesus was ministering, he was in a certain place. And the Bible says that there were 10 lepers that came to him. And they didn't come up to him and fall at his feet. The Bible says that they stood afar off. They stood a long way away from Jesus. And they cried out unto him. These 10 men cried out unto him and said, Son David, Jesus, have mercy on us. They began to cry out for mercy. They wanted healing. And the reason why these lepers stood afar off is because leprosy is a disease that is contagious. It's a, it's a, it's a, a very contagious disease and open sores in your body. In the Old Testament, it's commanded that lepers were not allowed to be in the, in, among society. They weren't allowed to be among people. They had to stay, be off by themselves in certain quarantine places so that they couldn't uh, contaminate everybody else with their disease. So that's why they stood afar off and they just shouted at Jesus, have mercy on us. You know what Jesus did? He shouted back to them. He said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, why would he do that? Well, in the Old Testament, if a, if a person had leprosy, if they, uh, if they were ever healed of leprosy, if they were ever cleansed of that, that, of that disease, it's a skin condition that causes open sores and, and uh, flesh to rot. If they were ever healed of that condition, they couldn't just say, well, I'm, I'm healed, I feel better, and go out. They had to go and show themselves to the priest, and the priest would pronounce them whole, or pronounce them healed, amen? So Jesus was saying to them, they said, have mercy upon us. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. In other words, do what the word of God says. Believe that you're healed and then go show yourself to the priest so that he can pronounce you healed. And the Bible says, as they went, as they obeyed Jesus, when they turned, as they went, at some distance away, we don't know if it was if it was 100 yards or a half mile or however far it was, they went, the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed as they went, as they obeyed Jesus and made their way to the priest. At some point in that, in that, in that, threat, in that distance, they were healed of leprosy. One leper turned around. Of the 10, the Bible says that one leper turned around. He came back to Jesus and the Bible says that he did something. He fell at Jesus' feet. And he began to, with, the Bible says, with a loud voice, he began to praise Jesus, to thank him, to glorify him, to glorify God with a loud voice. Amen? That's what the Bible says you should do. See, that's what was, was not folks say. Well, you know, Pastor, I have a thanksgiving in my heart. I have a thankful heart. That's not kind of what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about opening your mouth and praising and thanking God. Amen? We need to open our mouth. And the Bible says he did with a loud voice, praise and thank God. This is what Jesus said about those lepers. He asked the question Jesus did. He said, were there not 10 lepers that were cleansed? Didn't I cleanse 10 lepers? He said, where are the nine? Why didn't, why didn't all 10 of them come back and thank me? Only one of the 10 came back to even thank Jesus for cleansing them. And that, that was pretty serious. And Jesus said, oh, Drop the pen. I got it back. Jesus said that one that came back, he was a he was a Samaritan. He was a stranger. In other words, he wasn't the enemy. The Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. They looked down on the Samaritans. But this man had enough uh, sense to come back and and to say thank you for what he had gotten. Well, um, uh, the Bible says that Jesus spoke to that one leper, and this is what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, "Go your way." He said, go on, he said go, go on your way. Your faith, you are made whole. Your faith has made you whole. Now, Jesus said himself that 10 lepers were cleansed. 10 were cleansed. One was made whole. There's a difference between being cleansed and made whole. Being cleansed of leprosy means that the, 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 the condition stopped. He, it didn't progress any further. That, that skin disease 
healed up and his skin was smooth again. But leprosy is a disease that not just uh, damages the skin and causes open oozing sores, but it also causes the party, body parts to rot off. Your nose might rot off. Your ear might rot off. Your, your lips might, might rot off. Your fingers might fall off because of leprosy. Well, Jesus said, this man, this one man who came back and praised me and thanked me with a loud voice, the Bible says he wasn't just cleansed of leprosy, he was made whole. That means that his ear, if his old ear was rotten off, it grew back on. If his lips were rotten off, they grew back on. If his toes, his fingers, they grew back on. You know why? Because the power of God kept working to make him, Jesus said, to make him whole. That means complete. That means nothing missing. That means nothing broken. He was complete after that. Nine, the other nine, who didn't come back and thank God, well, they were cleansed. They didn't have leprosy no more, but they might have still had missing body parts, missing fingers, missing toes. You know, we don't know. But Jesus said, you go on home because you have been made, your faith has made you whole. Amen? So I guess the point is I'm making is that the miracle power of God was still working. They were still in the middle of a miracle, and thanksgiving and praise is what you do to keep the power of God working in your situation until you are made whole. I just don't want to touch from Jesus. I want complete wholeness. I just don't want to get a partial manifestation of good, something good happening in my life. I want to be made whole to all, all of what God has for me. Amen? And so do you. Amen? So what do you do? How do you receive that? Well, the Bible says that you need to, you need to also um, open your mouth. And like that one leper did, one of the ten came back and he began to give thanks. Amen? Giving thanks keeps the power of God turned on. I'm going to read one paragraph from my book. In the Midst of a Miracle, it's a free book. I'll send it to you. I'll tell you how to get it in a second. But this is uh, one thing I said here from the book of Habakkuk. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, the young prophet Habakkuk saw the devastation of Judah and how the land had been destroyed. The Bible says that the trees and the vines, the trees and the vines had no fruit and the field had no meat. The fields had no meat. In other words, there was no food to eat because the crops had all failed and the cattle were all dead. Everything in the natural had gone from bad to worse. Did you hear Habakkuk's situation? Everything in the, in the natural had gone from bad to worse. There was nothing, nothing. There was no crops, no herds. However, in the middle of this horrible situation, Habakkuk said something. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He went on to say, the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like the feet of a deer and cause me to walk upon my high places. Do you see what Habakkuk said? He said, even though I'm looking at everything around me is bad, everything around me is devastation. There is no food. There is no, uh, no meat. There's no, uh, there no crops, no herds. Everything is devastated around me. He said, yet I will rejoice. I will give thanks I'm going to praise God anyway. I'm not going to let that determine me for, uh, not praising my God. He, he praised God anyway. And he said, now God says that, now, now Habakkuk said, <clears throat> after he praised him, then he said, the Lord is my strength. He'll make my feet like the feet of a deer and cause me to walk upon my high places. Notice how Habakkuk is still looking at the high places. He still doesn't have any food. He still doesn't have his footing. He still doesn't know how God will turn his situation around, but he rejoices in God, the God of his salvation, regardless of what he sees. Even in the midst of that desperate situation, Habakkuk believed that God would guide his steps and cause him to walk upon his high places. Habakkuk believed that he would see the manifestation of God's goodness in turning the situation around. In the midst of that situation, amen, Habakkuk thanked God. And regardless of what situation you're in, you can say like Habakkuk. You can be looking at the worst doctor's report. You can be looking at the worst economic report, the worst job report, the worst situation in your marriage, the worst situation in, in your life or family, and you can still say like Habakkuk, yet I will. I don't deny what I'm seeing, but yet I will still thank God. I will still rejoice in God. I will praise God. And when you do, you keep... you. 
that something happens. The power of God is working to make you whole, to bring you out. Like, like, like David said, my enemies are about to be turned back. Like the leper found out, and one leper found out, I'm about to be made whole. I'm about to receive the completeness of what God has for me. You know, Jesus had wholeness for all 10 lepers. Only one got whole. Only one got whole. He wanted all 10 to be whole. Well, 10 of them got cleansed. Thank God for cleansing. Oh, but wholeness is better. Only one of them got it. That, that's, that thank, that's that one who thanked God and praised God with a loud voice. And Habakkuk got his situation turned around, even though it was dire and it was impossible. And so can you. This is all in my book, In the Midst of a Miracle. What do you do when you're in the midst and you haven't seen the manifestation yet? Those are some of the things that you do. Amen. So, Pastor Chris Turner, Rock Tabernacle Church, P.O. Box 100398, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53210. That's how you get in contact with me. You just email me, or you can email me. My wife gives you the email address. Email me, contact me, and we'll get it to you, no strings attached, and it'll be a blessing to you. And we'll check you out again next week. Until then, be blessed.